Hey everyone, let's talk about hieroglyphs. This video is just going to be an overview of the basics of the hieroglyphic writing system. Before I start, just a quick note on pronunciation. Throughout this video, I'll be using the Egyptological pronunciation of Egyptian. Egyptian was written without vowels, as for example, modern Arabic and Hebrew still are. For some words, it's possible to reconstruct what the vowels were based on the Coptic language, which is the modern descendant of Egyptian, or based on how Egyptian words, and especially names, were written in languages like Greek or Akkadian, which did write vowels. For many words, however, it's not possible to accurately reconstruct the vowels. In order to be consistent and to make it easy to pronounce words based just on the written form, the Egyptological pronunciation was invented. Certain consonants are pronounced as vowels, a, e, and u, and then the vowel e is inserted to break up any consonant clusters. This is not meant to be an accurate reconstruction of how these words were actually pronounced. It's just a simple way of turning written words consisting of long clusters of consonants into something that's easily pronounceable. As an example, the name of the god Anubis. The Egyptians didn't actually call him Anubis. This is the Greek version of his name. The written form of the Egyptian name consists of four consonants. Y, N, P, W. The old Egyptian pronunciation is reconstructed as Yanapau, which evolved into the late Egyptian pronunciation of Anop, which is the origin of the Greek name. The modern Egyptological pronunciation is Inepu. The hieroglyphic writing system is quite complex. It consists of over 5,000 total characters, although the number of characters that were in active use varied considerably over time. It's also quite redundant. It's very common for a single sound within a word to be indicated by multiple different characters. There are also multiple ways to write many words. In some cases, the preferred spelling has changed over time, and in other cases, two or more spellings were used interchangeably. Examples that I give shouldn't necessarily be considered the way to write something in hieroglyphs, just a way. Hieroglyphs were most commonly written from right to left, but sometimes they were also written left to right. How can you tell which way to read them? Easy. The symbols are flipped based on the intended reading direction. If you're familiar with the symbols, you can almost immediately determine which way to read them. If you aren't familiar, the easiest way to figure it out is to look for a human or an animal. Humans and animals always face towards the start of an inscription. So if they face towards the right, the text should be read from right to left, and if they face to the left, the text should be read from left to right. Here's an example with the name of the god Thoth, or Jehuti in Egyptian, written both left to right and right to left. You can easily tell which way it's intended to be read by looking at the direction that the ibis and the god face. The writing's not always entirely linear, the middle element of this name is not a single character, it's actually two characters stacked on top of each other. It's very common to see two or three characters stacked like this in order to use space more efficiently. For the rest of this video, I'll be sticking with the left to right reading direction. There are two ways that hieroglyphs can be used. They can either be phonetic, representing sounds, or semantic, representing meaning. Most words are written with a combination of phonetic and semantic symbols. Phonetic symbols represent sounds, or more specifically, consonants. They may be monoliteral, representing one sound, biliteral, representing two sounds, or triliteral, representing three sounds. There are 26 monoliteral characters, representing the 24 different consonant phonemes of Egyptian, plus one phoneme that only appears in foreign names. The characters transcribed as J and Y both represent the same sound. There are abbreviated forms of the Y and W symbols, which are commonly used in many words, as they're simpler to write than the full versions. There are also alternative symbols representing the same sounds as M and N. These are relatively rare. Words written in monoliterals are pretty simple to read and generally don't cause too much trouble. With these symbols, it would be possible to write any word in the Egyptian language. 
In practice, though, only a relatively small proportion of words were ever written with just monoliteral, and these were combined with other phonetic symbols as well as semantic symbols. The other phonetic symbols are biliteral and triliteral symbols. There are over a hundred biliterals and about 40 triliterals. On screen now are some examples of some of the more commonly used ones. An example of a word written with biliterals is the word mescar, which means leather. The last symbol here is a determiner, which I'll explain more later, but it's not actually pronounced. The phonetic part of the word is the first two symbols, which are both biliterals. The first one is mess, and the second one is car. While biliterals and triliterals can stand on their own, as in this example, more often than not they're combined with monoliterals, representing some or all of the same sounds. These are called phonetic complements. Most often, the phonetic complement will repeat the last sound of biliteral, or the last two sounds of a triliteral. As an example, the word ankh, meaning life or living, can be written with just the ankh sign, or it can be written with the unk sign, followed by two monoliterals representing the sounds n and ch. Occasionally, a symbol can be pronounced multiple ways, and the phonetic complement serves to distinguish which reading is intended. Most of the time, though, only one reading is possible, and the phonetic complements only serve to remind the reader of what that reading is. The other kind of hieroglyphic symbols are semantic hieroglyphs. These represent meanings and they can be divided into logograms and determiners. Logograms represent whole words. For many logograms, the meaning is pretty transparent. The character that looks like a man represents the word for man. The character that looks like a bull represents the word for bull. Three wavy lines represent water. For other words, the meaning is a little more abstract. An arm holding a scepter represents control while two arms in a shrugging gesture represent not. Many hieroglyphs that are used as logograms can also be phonetic symbols or determiners. To unambiguously indicate that a symbol is meant to be a logogram, a small vertical stroke can be added near it. The cobra hieroglyph is usually a monoliteral sign for the sound j, but with the addition of the stroke, it is the logogram representing the word cobra, or jet. Logograms can be combined with phonetic complements, representing some or all of the sounds of the word. The word mu, water, can be written with just the logogram water, or it can be written with this logogram plus the phonetic complement u. The final kind of hieroglyphs are determiners. Determiners can never stand alone, but are combined with logograms and or phonetic symbols. Determiners give hints as to the meaning of the word. In many cases, determiners serve simply to remind the reader of the meaning of a word, but sometimes they can distinguish words that would otherwise be written identically. It's worth noting that because Egyptian was written without vowels, there are many pairs of words that would have been different in speech, but written the same. This makes determiners more useful than they might otherwise be. Here's a great example of determiners distinguishing words that would otherwise be identical. The words for dog, to cut, to complain, and wrongdoing all contain the same two phonetic characters, a biliteral iu and a phonetic complement u, but they have different determiners. The word dog is written with the determiner dog, which is pretty self-explanatory. The word cut is written with the determiner knife, Again, pretty obvious. The word complain is written with the determiner of a man with a hand to his mouth. This is used as a determiner for words for speaking as well as words for eating and drinking. Finally, the word wrongdoing is written with the determiner sparrow. The sparrow is used as a determiner for words relating to badness, such as binet, meaning evil, or nef, meaning mistake. I'm not sure what sparrows did to the Egyptians to deserve it, but there you go. And finally, there are just a few other quirks of the writing system that I'd like to mention. In nouns, characters can be doubled to indicate the dual number, which has a special form in the Egyptian language, or tripled to indicate the plural number. Ta means land. When the logogram is doubled, it becomes 
Tawi, two lands, i.e. Egypt, which consists of Upper and Lower Egypt. This logogram is Necher, meaning God, which can be tripled to become Necheru, or Gods. Doubling and tripling of characters is mainly found in older writing, with newer writing generally preferring to use the dual or plural determiners instead. Lastly, there's honorific transposition. This is a special rule that when writing compound words or certain set phrases, important words, such as those relating to gods, are written first, even if they're not pronounced first. The name of the pharaoh Tutankhamun, which literally means living image of Amun, is written as Imen Tut Ankh, even though it's still pronounced as Tut Ankh Imen, because Imen is the name of a god. It's written first as a sign of respect. So yeah, those are the basic rules for reading and writing hieroglyphs. As always, I hope you found this video interesting, and thanks for watching.